Thank you, Alex, for having me. I'm, I'm still having the image of you and Taco Bell stuck in my head, so maybe we can spend some time talking about that. Yeah, we can. Um, uh, 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 next next run, it's all about uh, about burning calories for the Taco Bell consumption. So we'll we'll cover that then. But um, today we can you know jump into some stuff. Um, I mean, I know uh, Rebecca already introduced Percy, but um, yeah, Percy's uh, been been a powerhouse at at, at Stanford. He's in the computer science statistics uh, department, the AI lab, ML group, NLP, human centered AI, and now most recently the director of the Stanford Center for Research on Foundation Models, also co founder of Together AI. So lots of lots of potential stuff to talk about. Um, we'll see what we can get through today. But let's start with the term uh, foundation model. So that's a that's a term for you know I I see kind of people using large language model, foundation model, Gen AI, uh, kind of all synonymously. Sometimes just Chat GPT as a moniker for you know one of these large uh, pre trained self supervised models. Um, why did why did uh, you know you and the the CRFM group pick that term? Why did you get behind it? Were you at all surprised by let's call it the robust Twitter debate over the terminology? Um, uh, and then let's start there. And then maybe how does that that terminology align with the with your perspective on 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 CRFM's objective? Yeah, sure. So uh, if we rewind two years ago, um, well, actually two and a half years ago, which seems like a eon, uh, this is when we founded the center. So it was a uh, uh, just me going around the, the university and seeing who was interested in this this phenomenon that was happening post GPT three. Um, it was clear to to me and others that this was going to be a you know big paradigm shift. Maybe we didn't anticipate that it would happen so quickly in the span of uh, two years, but we knew that this was going to go somewhere. And we felt that it was a, a phenomenon that was deeper than just language models. So technically, a language model is just a model over language. Um, often it's um, restricted to, um, not necessarily, but often associated with autoregressive language models where you're predicting the next word. Um, but of course, there are other vision models. There's uh, models of other modalities. And we felt like... Um, language model sort of undersells the, the potential of these, these models. And so we coined the term foundation model. And a foundation model, just to define it properly, is a model that's trained on broad data and can be adapted lightly to a wide range of downstream tasks. And which, so foundation model is, um, we thought a lot about the naming and the definition. We wrote up um, the report. There's a whole section on naming, so I won't go into all the details. Um, but but I think the important part is that it behaves as a, a foundation, which is which is why the, we chose the term. It's um, instead of people building bespoke models and bespoke data sets in a in a vertical sense, you have this foundation which gets built once based on a ton of capital, and then this model can be adapted to a wide range of different tasks in in question answering, customer service bots, information extraction, uh, what have you. And that to, to us signified uh, a paradigm shift in how AI systems uh, were built. So, so we, that's why we coined, coined the term. So technically just to make sure, there's a lot of confusion about this. Foundation models is a class that contains large language models, also contains visual language models, contains um, you know things like clip and, and so on. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think, I mean, you know, when I try to do the one slide version of this, which I don't claim to be exactly aligned with the very, you know, thorough thought process uh, that that um, the CRFM group went through, but I, I often kind of come to three basic things uh, that point towards the need for a more general term than LLM, even though I, you, we, we use LLM a lot because it's, it's such a, such a kind of popularized term now. You know, one is it's not just language, uh, really anything, I mean, anything with underlying graph structure you can apply the same autoregressive approaches, right? Um, you know, pretty much plug and play. Um, uh, it's not just um, uh, it's not just generative use cases where you know, which which usually means some kind of open schema, long form response generating text image. It's also really good for you know traditional predictive or classification extraction tagging type activities. Um, and I like you know the, the the foundation metaphor, right? There's often some house building required on top and. Obviously, a lot of what we've done at Snorkel and then in, in you know back at the Stanford Lab and, and, and at UW and many others in the space is really all about that house building on top. How do you adapt it or fine tune it or or otherwise customize it for specific 
uh, uh, well, here, you know, this is technically an enterprise LLM summit. So for specific enterprise settings, you know, I think of enterprise just meaning kind of, you know, a group that has their own data and their own objectives. How do you adapt and customize the model? That's the the building the house on top of the foundations. Yeah. Yeah, just to add that, I think that's a really important point because I think this is distinguished from, uh, for example, if you think about ChatGPT or people who are trying to build the you know AGI, uh, it's it's sort of a whole stack. We're just going to build a system and then that's it. You're just going to be a user. But I think the foundation model really illustrates that we're not building the whole stack. We're building the the foundation, and you can't move into a house if you don't have the rest of the house. And, and I think the idea is that once you have a very strong foundation, the house is much easier to build. And people want to build different houses um, with, in different ways. And it's, it, the idea is that you should be able to customize um, the style of the, the model that you want, the data, of course, in the enterprise setting, every enterprise has different data. So you're not gonna have literally using the same, same model. And that customization, I think, is a really a key part of, of of the paradigm. So that that'll lead us in a second uh, to to talking about evaluation, because you know you can't. I think the 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 thing that, that many enterprises, many real world practitioners are finding out, you know, it, it sounds obvious to say it, but it but it um, you can't figure out how to do that customization or uh, where you even need it without some evaluation metric that's fine-grained enough. So we'll get into that and, and, and a lot of the work that you've spearheaded there. But quickly, you know, we had a, we had a little conversation about this um, a little while back, but what are some of your intuitions on where that house building is most needed? Because there are definitely, you know, many exciting areas where you can kind of use one of these foundation models out of the box. And by out of the box, I kind of mean, you know, minimal effort, maybe some basic prompting, uh, a zero or very, very, you know, low, low number, few shot approach. What's your intuition for the settings where you expect you might need? I mean, you can, again, we'll get to evaluation, which will tell you quantitatively, but intuitively, where do these models not work out of the box? Yeah, I think of the whole pipeline of building a, a, a system and where these models really excel is in the prototyping phase, right? Rather than going into a meeting and making a, month-long plan to build some prototype, you you prompt it and in five minutes you have a working prototype. And, and I think that is just something that can't be sort of overstated how powerful that is. It, it helps you brainstorm, it helps you um, just uh, think of things that you might not have. Um, and, and so that's very powerful. Now, prototyping obviously is very different from building an actual robust system. Um, and as the models get better, of course, you start pushing um, the, uh, the the line towards, okay, well, we can build something that's not just a prototype, but actually a, a reasonable working system. Um, but of course, in the limit uh, for an application, which has many, many users and custom data, and the users are giving feedback, and you really want fine-grained control, I think you have to customize and you have to fine-tune and, and uh, using using the data, otherwise you're just uh, losing a lot uh, you're, uh, off the table. So um, I think this is just this progression. And I think in certain cases you can get quite far, um, but but if you're generating user feedback, there has to be a way to, to, to use it because the system is not gonna be, it can't read your mind, it, it can't be perfect. It, it makes a lot of sense. And I can't read your mind. I think it has a lot to do with, you know, there's there may be kind of universal grammars in in you know various data modalities out there on the internet, but what you actually want to do, what your users want, what your enterprise wants, you know, you can't. There's no mind reading, right? There's no omnipotence. You have to tell the model that somehow. Um, I really like that metaphor of kind of first and 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 you know, first mile acceleration, and then last mile kind of tuning and development. We're also seeing now a trend where you'll kind of use one of these massive, large generalists to do the first mile. And then you'll not only fine tune, but also distill or shrink the model into kind of smaller, cheaper, you know, uh, uh, lower latency specialists, which is which is fascinating. But I think this, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're a little over halfway through. So this kind of naturally leads to evaluation, right? You know, if you're going to do your first mile explorations, you, you can't really responsibly ship something to production. You can't find out what tuning, tuning you need to do to traverse that kind of last mile that, that you just talked about, unless you have a sense of, you know, how the model is doing. And in general, there's there's lots of other uh, other things. So I know that you know you big part of what you've been working on and, and focused on and, and ha has had a, a huge impact on the space is the the Helm project. So would love to to just hear a little bit of that, and then 
you know, I mean, up to you what you want to highlight, but maybe the, you know, I know you've been recently putting out some exciting work on the transparency index. Would love to hear a little bit about your perspective, kind of what you're working on there and where you think the next steps are in, you know, in evaluation work in general. What's what's missing for the average user or enterprise? Yeah, so much to say. Let's see what we can do. So starting with Helm. So we released Helm about a year ago, um, a holistic evaluation of language models. Um, and what we're trying to do there is to develop a standardized way of evaluating, uh, starting with language models, but now we're moving to um, multimodal models as well. And uh, the, the challenge here is that if you're evaluating, a lang how do you evaluate a language model? You know, it, it's a generalist system. So it's not like you're evaluating a spam classifier and you're getting a, just a notion of accuracy or AUC. Um, I think you have to sort of imagine and cover the space of possible use cases, which is which is challenging. And on top of that, we were focusing on not just accuracy, but bias and robustness and calibration and other uh, and efficiency and all these factors. So that's why it's holistic. We try to look at all these different dimensions, all these uh, scenarios, and as well as taking all the models that we could get our hands on, about 30 models, and evaluate them systematically. So we put that out. It's on the, the website, all the predictions, all the code and everything. So it's a, a resource um, for, for the community. And over time, we've been updating it because a model comes out every, every week or so. And we are trying frantically to try to, um, to keep up with that. Um, so, so I think, Helm, you should think about it now at this point as a framework. We made some initial choices about curating the data sets. But more importantly, I think for maybe the audience, it's a, it's a really a framework for evaluation where you can come with a particular uh, evaluation uh, data set, which could be custom, it could be uh, redefined, or you come up with your model, which could be a standard model or a custom model that you fine tune. And we do the the you know the prompting and the the finagling to produce numbers and the reports and and so on. So we've seen uh, people using it for various uh, different you know, purposes, different um, you know, companies that are uh, leveraging it. So, so I think that's quite exciting. And I hope that this will grow into um, a much more standard platform for doing evaluation of uh, foundation models. Um, I should mention one thing actually, which is just be announced today is we're working with ML Commons uh, to develop uh, safety evaluations on, on top of Helm, which is really exciting because, um, again, this is an area that's of utmost concern given uh, that these models are um, posed uh, not uh, pose certain risk in addition to having you know benefits, and quantifying that is is uh, super you know important. Um, I think what you should think about evaluation of language models is is doing is. Um, there's upstream and downstream, right? So the language model is up, upstream. It's a, um, and the evaluations we do try to give you a sense of what the models are capable of, but this is not necessarily what you would, the metric that uh, you would evaluate if you were looking at the, the product. But, but I think uh, it's valuable to um, evaluate upstream metrics and later when you, you actually get a product experience, you sort of correlate these metrics. You look at uh, whatever tasks, very product specific metrics and try to correlate it with the, the upstream metrics. And now you have a very uh, potentially good guide of when you see um, accuracy on med QA, you know, what does that mean? Well, okay, well, I know that this is not perfect, but maybe it's a weak indicator that this model is actually better at medical knowledge, which is relevant for my uh, domain. I, I really like that idea of up and downstream. I actually hadn't hadn't uh, uh, hadn't hadn't, hadn't uh, looked at that yet before. Um, so I, I think um, I mean, may, so, you know, what, one way to maybe think about it, and I also like the distinction of, of kind of um, make, making it clear that Helm is a is a framework. There's there's a benchmark that people think about, but it's really a framework for for building and running benchmarks, which is uh, is quite powerful given that a lot of the 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 real production, the last mile development that we just talked about is is using custom data sets, custom objectives. Uh, so I think that's a that's a great a great point to highlight. On the kind of upstream and downstream, I mean, maybe I, I'm imagining something where you have like 
downstream is kind of user, you know, user CSAT or feedback scores of, you know, I like this, this chatbot and upstream, uh, you know, is, is these kind of generic, you know, public benchmarks. Do you think there's a middle ground, especially for enterprises that have their own kind of, you know, uh, um, sub tasks or sub data sets, yeah. sub subsets that they care about or slices. We've used the term sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Is missing for kind of enterprise evaluation as maybe yeah, that's a like question for this group. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point. And what we're evolving Helm into is uh, besides the framework that we're building, um, having these notion of um, Helmlets or Helmets, we haven't decided on the exact name, where we take slices exactly as you, you as you put it of the use cases. So, for example, for coding, or for the medical domain, or for uh, for the legal domain, or the financial domain, um, or for uh, different languages. Uh, we have one, uh, you know, some folks from uh, from Hong Kong University have developed a Chinese uh, evaluation, which we've integrated into Home. Boli has uh, developed this uh, decoding trust. Um, uh, benchmark, which is being integrated into Helm, which captures a certain aspect of trustworthiness. So we think about these as um, these subdomains, if you will, which can capture maybe the things that you're interested in. And uh, for various, uh, I think we're going to start thinking about, let's say, customer service as well, working with um, uh, some a company on this. And uh, we hope to populate Helm with uh, a wide variety of ecologically valid uh, benchmarks um, where enterprises would care about. And then the task is less about coming up with a new benchmark and evaluating, but just curating. It's like, I care about this, I care about that, I care about that. Tell me which and rank the models. Yeah, I, I think that's super interesting. I mean, I think a lot of people have likened what you see in the ecosystem, you know, kind of the ecosystem. I mean, you, you, your, your, your center charts this as well, this kind of you know family tree of models going from, I mean, you have a lot of you know, you have lineages of generalist models, but then you increasingly see, especially in enterprises, kind of this kind of family tree of specialized ones, you know, specialized for the domain, the subdomain, the specific, you know, group, the specific task, et cetera. I can imagine evaluations would naturally track that of having like the generic ones, then the domain specific ones, then kind of successively more fine grained ones um, as you get more precise. But uh, it's super cool to see how that that's going to get supported, and I love the awesome naming. Every every good academic project has to have a properly, yeah. uh, you know, a goofy name. Uh, name driven research. Uh, just one. I know we're out of time, but I think one important uh, comment I want to make is that in the era of foundation models, I think it's really exciting for evaluation because before in machine learning. You had to get a data set, you have to hire a whole data team and annotate, and then you train, divide into train and test. And the ability to do few shot learning or even zero shot learning means that you can focus on just evaluation and you can get domain experts who will sit down and actually tell you what they what they want and and you know, and then rely on the general abilities or raw strength of the models to actually deliver something interesting. So I, I think. I'm optimistic that we'll see a lot more interesting evaluations uh, coming online as these models get stronger, um, which is, I think, exciting because that's what we always wanted in machine learning evaluation rather than stuck with uh, this, you know, this synthetic, uh, semi-synthetic data sets of, yep. the, of the past to which everyone complains about. Yeah, and it also goes back to your point about it, it just lowers the barrier for the first mile exploration, right? So you always want to do, be doing kind of test-driven or evaluation-driven development, you know, start with where is the model messing up and where should you be focusing? And now you can get to that, as you said, much faster, or maybe that's, I don't know, that's a slightly different point, but just the ability to kind of get to the evaluation sooner, spend more time there, and then do your development, your adaptation, your fine-tuning, et cetera, driven by that evaluation um, seems really very exciting as a, a, a better development paradigm. Yeah, totally. Completely agree. Cool. Well, I, I think we're at time. There's our there's our hook. Um, yeah. Okay. But Percy, thank you so much uh, for spending the time with us and with this group today. Uh, that's uh, you know you're doing some awesome work there as the as the whole community is grateful for and um, really appreciate getting your thoughts on it today. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks for the inviting me, Alex.